Greetings once again, AP Calculus BC students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we're getting ready to take a look at our second example, example number two from our fictitious topic entitled 6.15. I know there's no topic 6.15 in the CED, but we've added a few topics to round out our sort of advanced integration technique experience. And we're taking a look at some problems that you would typically see in a Calculus 2 course. If you had a chance to check out our first video, first example one, we introduced the idea of integrating sine and cosine products that had higher exponents attached to both of them. We're going to go ahead and extend that idea, but this time we have a very interesting type of integral. We have this odd cosine with some unusual kind of sine, and we're going to take a look at it right now. Now, it's also a definite integral. That's really besides the point in terms of trying to use the integration techniques that we've talked about. We'll introduce those uh, boundaries here towards the end of the problem. But I'm focused more on what do we do when we have this odd cosine on top and then this very strange square root of sine in the bottom. Well, if you take a look at this, you're going to have to realize that the odd exponents are the things that really tend to cause the problems. Believe it or not, it's not so much that square root of sine. That's not problematic like this cosine to the cube is. So what we're going to do is, in very typical fashion, we are going to peel off one of those powers of cosine. And so we'll go ahead and leave the boundaries in the problem, even though we probably aren't going to address them for a while. And we'll call that cosine to the third power a cosine squared. Now, I'm going to also suggest that we do something with this square root of sine. Typically, what we would do with any kind of square root in a calculus problem is change it to a fractional exponent. And so we'll do that, calling it now to the negative half power. and that's the same equivalency there as the square root of sine in the denominator. And don't forget, I owe a power or a factor of cosine still from what I peeled away. Now, our philosophy, our motivation behind doing this, right? We always need motivation with mathematics. And that is to make this expression our du. Well, that's pretty clear then that our u is likely going to be a sine. And we have a sine of x elsewhere in our integrand, but we also have this cosine squared that we're not too thrilled about. But fortunately, we have a trig identity that will take care of that. And so we go to the phase two of the problem, and that would be to rewrite your cosine squared as one minus sine squared. You're just using your Pythagorean identity that we talked about uh, would be very commonly used uh, back in the first video. And then, of course, we have our sine of x still raised to the negative half cosine of x. Now this is going to set the stage for your u substitution. As we indicated earlier, you're going to go ahead and let u be the sine of x. That's going to mean that your derivative of u is going to be positive cosine of x dx. And so we have a perfect match. This expression right here is going to be easily swapped out with our du. And so what that would give us now is a 1 minus u squared multiplied by u to the negative half power followed up with the du. And hopefully that makes some sense. Now, I guess we've got a slight decision to make here. What should we do about the boundaries? Should we rewrite them in terms of u now and then never have to worry about back substituting, or should we go ahead and perform our integration with respect to u and then back substitute our sine and then we could use the original boundaries. It's always up to you. I don't really think that it matters much. Um, I'm trying to kind of vary this a little bit with what I've done in some other videos and not tell you what I'm very tempted to do. I'm going to say let's not change the boundaries and rewrite our final answer in terms of x. Now, that being said, I don't want to put pi over 3 and pi over 6 in those spots, but I don't want to put nothing because if I put nothing there, I'm quite certain that by the time I go through a couple of steps, I'm going to forget that there's boundaries there. See, I'm getting old, unlike you guys that probably could remember. So let's go ahead and put an A and a B there just as temporary placeholders to remind me that this is indeed a definite integral. 
And so what's going to happen now before we do any type of integration is we are going to distribute our u to the negative half into this expression and so that we can turn this into a uh, just basically a difference of two separate expressions. It's, it's sort of acting like a polynomial, although it does have a very strange exponent. 2 plus 1 half, that's negative, would be 1 and a half or 3 halves power and then our du. And now we're finally ready to integrate this. I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. When we integrate u to the negative half, we get u to the positive half divided by 1 half or multiplied by 2, one and the same. And when we integrate u to the 3 halves, we would get u to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves, which is the same as multiplying by 2 fifths. Don't need a plus c constant because this is a definite integral that's going to be evaluated from our b to a, but not for long because we're now going to go ahead and back substitute. We remember that our u was the sine of x, so I will replace each of these u's with a sine of x. I see that the first u is raised to the half power, so it makes a lot of sense to me to maybe call that square root of sine, and then I'll rewrite my second one, minus two-fifths, and I guess I could do a couple of different things here. Uh, I could call this sine to the 5 halves power. Maybe that would be the easiest thing to do right now. I could also call it the square root of sine, all raised to the fifth. A lot of different options. Uh, why don't we go ahead and maybe use square roots, since I've already done that in the previous part of the problem. And then I'll raise this up to the fifth. And now I'm just focusing on what's going to happen when I replace those x's with these boundaries and subtract using the fundamental theorem. So essentially at that point we've got our definite integration. Our technique of definite integration is finished. The rest of this is just doing some practice with some evaluation. So we're going to go ahead and plug in the pi over 3. Now as I do that I'm going to work this on the fly. So I've got the sine of pi over 3. Now if you're a unit circle person you can rely on that. If you're one of those left hand finger tricks you can use that if you're one of those really wild smart people that have these memorized that's even better pi over three i could put that angle right here that's like our 60 degree angle picture may not be drawn to scale pi over six would be up here that would be our 30 degree angle and i know that the ratio would always be one square root three and two and so i have the sine of pi over three which would be root 3 over 2. Now, notice that I'm taking the square root of that. Okay, that doesn't look real fun, right? No, it doesn't look like fun. So i tell you what we might do with this. Rather than to embed square roots inside of each other, maybe it's best to think about this as fractional exponents. I'm going to go down that road first. So if you remember the sine of pi over 3 was square root of 3 over 2. We just have to realize that that square root of 3 over 2 is still going to be raised to the 1 half power. And I think I'm going to continue with that same philosophy. In other words, when I get to this next term, 2 fifths, the square root of sine of pi over 3 again is our square root of 3 over 2. But rather than putting a square root around it and raising that to the fifth, let's just cause this uh, to be raised to the 5 over 2 power. It, it's just the way that the problem is written, and it, it's probably not worth our time and effort to embed square roots. And if we do the same thing here for sine of pi over 6, now the sine of pi over 6 is going to be 1 half. Not quite as ugly, but still... I'm going to adopt the same philosophy. I'm going to use a half exponent here, and I'm going to elect to use a five halves exponent, say right there. And for all intents and purposes, that's going to be our answer. Um, I don't really have a big problem with leaving it like that. I've written multiple choice questions that tend to work out this way, and uh, we just, you know, uh, basically say that that's our result, and uh, we can match the, the correct answer accordingly. But anyhow, you got a good look at what you're going to do whenever you're dealing with an odd cosine this time, and then you find out that sometimes it just may not matter what your sign looks like.
if it's in the denominator, if it has a square root over it, because the key is to use the correct exponent, in this case, negative one half, and then everything will tend to fall into place after that. Anyway, I hope this example helps you out a little bit, and we've got another one coming up for you with example three that's gonna be quite interesting. I'm going to hide the sign of X from you and see how you guys react. So be sure to check out our third example over Topic 615. We'll see you next time.